It started with my mother, a woman so devoted to her husband and the idea of their future family that she converted to Judaism before their marriage, ensuring official Jewishness for their coming secession of male heirs. Three daughters later, much to the horror of my paternal grandmother, who forgave this sin of chromosomal pairing exactly never, my parents gave up their quest for a boy. Despairing of ever earning my grandmother's approval after my youngest sister's birth, my mother unbuttoned the mantle of Jewish obligation with glee, quit the temple, and unceremoniously ended years of temple school. But even at the height of my mother's fervor, our Jewish upbringing was marginal at best. She adores Christmas and saw its designation as the birth of an inconvenient ex-savior as no barrier to its celebration. We had a Hanukkah bush with Hanukkah baubles that looked suspiciously like Christmas ornaments, <laughs> stockings, Santa. My sisters and I lacked for no pagan candy-related aspect of the holiday. When asked what we were celebrating by her very young children, she replied, light in the darkness. <laughs> I inherited her love of trees, lights, and Santa, but I am at heart much, much lazier than my Midwestern daughter of a Union Railroad man mother. Hanukkah seemed easier and quieter, with more bagels. <laughs> to torture me over the years, she has sent as many Christmas trappings as possible. Advent calendars, ornaments, things that have to be remembered day after day in December. But her crowning achievement in the Christmas torture traditions game came in the mail two years ago. The elf on the shelf. <laughs> you know it. It comes with a book describing the rules of elf play, including one must name one's elf. The elf flies to Santa every night to tattle on the resident children and returns to a different spot every morning. The elf must not be touched during daylight hours or it loses its magic. We named our elf Jingles. So far, so good. For the first few days, I did all right, although I did bolt out of bed every morning at 6 a.m. and run downstairs to move the elf because magic creepy elves that run to Santa and tattle on children do not move themselves. <laughs> on the eighth day of Jingle's employment in our home, I wanted to put the elf back in the kids' room, mainly, I admit, because I kind of liked their mild hysteria when they woke and found themselves overseen by one of Santa's little <laughs> helper demons. I know, it says elf on the shelf, and I don't know how many shelves there are in actual Christian homes, but in our pagan Jewish home, there are only so many shelves, and then you have to start getting creative. <laughs> I went for the only other high available surface, which seemed fairly logical at the time because it was winter, and who the hell turns on the ceiling fans in the winter? <laughs> Of course, Garrett woke up and took one look at that elf on the ceiling fan and turned the damn thing on. <laughs> I wasn't there, but I take great, great amusement in imagining Jingles whipping around a few times before he was flung across the room, lying face down on the floor. This is the point at which I woke from a sound and happy slumber, having actually remembered to move the elf the night before, because Garrett the perpetrator of the authenticide, lost his mind. <laughs> Two hours later, red-faced and swollen, the child still sobbed inconsolably. Ah, ah, accident, ah, ah, accident. <laughs> I felt bad. I did, for my part in the crime. In my defense, he wasn't particularly concerned about the welfare of long-suffering jingles, but more deeply afraid that his small victim would somehow drag its broken body back to the North Pole <laughs> and, with its dying breath, prostrate at Santa's feet, gasp out, Garrett! Garrett! thereby eliminating any possibility of blaming this tragic accident on his sister. <laughs> there was nothing to do but make up a string of ridiculous lies. Isn't that the magic of Christmas? Lying to your children? 
We had to leave the room so the elf could go back to Santa who could kiss him and make him feel better with his Christmas magic. Jingles might need a day to recover, but we were certain he would return. And of course, both Jingles and Santa would know it was an accident. Also, we have heard they are particularly forgiving of children whose mothers were raised poorly and are hopelessly inept at Christmas. <laughs> The children went downstairs and I hid the stupid elf in my closet. Jingles grumbled his way back to the North Pole to smoke a cigarette and wait for all the other elves to return so he could bitch about how he was the unluckiest elf in the history of elves on shelves. And did they realize that just two doors down, Crinkle had the cushiest assignment ever? My friend Meg, who is Catholic and very, very safety conscious and would never even think of placing a small personage of any kind, creepy or no, on a ceiling fan. <laughs> of all the luck, he gets stuck with this Stacy idiot. While Jingles grumbled and smoked, we composed a lovely note of apology to both Jingles and Santa and promised never to turn on anything upon which Jingles sat ever, <laughs> ever again. Jingles returned, creepy as ever, safely seated on the curtain bar in the nursery the next morning. The very next morning, the damn thing went on strike and refused to move from that spot. Or my brain went on strike, or Christmas went on strike. Crestfallen, Garrett, Sage, and Quinn tiptoed into our room to tell us that the elf hadn't moved. It was over. Christmas must surely be dead. <laughs> I thought, vague and deflated from my pillow, that I had failed at Christmas magic. I was not my mother. I can't make dinner every night for a week, let alone sustain the illusion of Jingles the Elf for a month. <laughs> Matt opened one bleary eye to peer at our children. He gets a day off, he told them with authority. Workman's comp. <laughs> And that is how Matt and I failed Christmas Magic 101 and Basic Elf. We've been banned from elf ownership on both poles. I blame my mother. <laughs>